Well, today's Easter Sunday, um, and around the world, Christians are gathering in various places of worship to celebrate the very central aspect of our faith, which we say is the resurrection of Christ. Um, so what I want us to do, actually, if you were given an outline, is I want us to actually go back to the very first Easter time uh, when we had this whole thing of Jesus going to trial, um, being scourged, being whipped, a crown of thorns placed on his head, taken to a place of execution, what we call the cross, being crucified, being buried, a stone is put in place, uh, and then something absolutely miraculous happened. And as the resurrected Christ is now starting to demonstrate himself among others, we come to this part of the Easter story, which we often don't really think about, but actually it kind of ties more with our own lives. And it's found in Luke chapter 24. We're going to start reading at verse 13. So here we go. The same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem, and as they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. And he asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, You must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. What things, Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, but he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. And they said his body was missing, and they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to sea, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all of these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from the scriptures the things concerning himself. And by this time, they were nearing Emmaus in the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if, he, as if he were going on. But they begged him, stay the night with us since it is getting late. So he went home with them. And as they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. And suddenly, then he broke it and gave it to them. And suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. And they said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. And there they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them, who said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. And then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road and how they recognized him as he was breaking the bread. You know, as we come and wrestle with this is part of the Easter story of Jesus' resurrection, the thing I want us just to, to wrestle with for a moment is that we live in a world today that actually considers the resurrection of Jesus both implausible and unbelievable. Um, I mean, when we read this account, we have to understand we live in a world that really says honestly, you don't seriously really believe this really happened. At times, I wonder as Christians, the intellectual and educated world looks at our claims today, and, and even though they're dismissive of them, they are actually quite polite. They're not going to make a big deal of it. They're going to say, if you, oh, if you believe that, if, if that gives you hope in the face of struggles and life and death, then, well, then good for you. 
But if you start to really push that message with other people, they're going to start looking at you like we look at people who believe in the flat earth. I mean, I've met a few flat earth people, and I go, really? Seriously? Do you ever watch those things from, you know, the space station that shows the earth is kind of round? But, but, but you know what? I think there's a lot of people in our secular society today that you rub shoulders with on a regular basis. And maybe yourself, you're like that. You're saying, Dave, it's great the church does some good things and helps out the poor once in a while, and it's a shame they're tearing down churches more in Canada. But really, seriously? You seriously are telling me that, that you believe that someone who physically died came back to life? Seriously? Well, as we, as we deal with the story of the resurrection of Jesus, I want us to understand some critical things about it. And, and I guess for us, just in these next few minutes, really quickly, I need to help you make sense of it. So how do we make sense of the resurrection of Jesus? Just like the two on the Emmaus Road, I think, first of all, we see two things that happen. Do you notice here that, that the first thing they actually did was they discussed what was going on. They, they, they looked at what was happening. I mean, here they were. They were, realized that, first of all, Jesus was executed. And, and he, that means he really died. Um, I mean, there are certain faiths in the world that say Jesus didn't, didn't die. No, he, he was executed, hung on a cross. And then um, they're saying, you know, he was put in a tomb. And, and now there's this empty tomb. Um, he's not there anymore. And they're being told that Jesus is alive. Please understand something. If Christianity is true, it only comes down really to one matter. I mean, you can sit and we can argue about evolution and creationism. We can argue about, you know, the David and Goliath story. We can talk about, you know, did the Red Sea really part and all that. But if you really want to get right down to the one, number one question about Christianity, it comes down to this. Did Jesus raise from the dead or not? Because if he didn't raise from the dead, then he's no different than all these other cults and, you know, false religions or people who get up throughout the ages and say, I'm the one, and then, of course, they die, and then everyone realizes, I knew they weren't the one. And that's all that happened to Jesus. Then all at the very best he was, was a good teacher because he said some incredible things. But the sad part is, I have to admit, If someone who was saying some good things but also claimed to be God and said, I and my Father are one, and if you believe in me, I go prepare a place for you, and I'll come back for you, and he made all these transcendent divine claims about himself, and then if he just died, that really makes him not a good person. That makes him a fraud. Are you with me? So he's really not worth believing in, and to be honest with you, we're kind of foolish for believing in ourselves. A famous scholar by the name of N.T. Wright made this clear as he studied those ancient documents in that ancient culture of the Greco-Roman world when Christianity was birthed. He said this, he said, the first generation of Christians answered why they existed very simply, because Jesus was raised from the dead. You see, As Christians, we say this really matters. This is not an optional issue for us. Paul, an early church leader, and one who helped establish the early Christian church in the first century, wrote to Christians, he said this, if Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. Mary Holtz, reflecting on Paul's words, sums it up this way, Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we're idiots. We bought into a lie. We should be pitied. And if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, we have insulted God because we said that he raised Jesus from the dead and that Jesus was the Messiah. And if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then he wasn't the Messiah and we got everything wrong. And actually, we're just pathetic people believing in a pathetic lie. But let's remember what we have to wrestle with here. Today, we're, we're naming this message the empty tomb. See, the question of history is not that the tomb was empty. The question for history and for us is how did the tomb of Jesus become empty? Was the body stolen? Was it misplaced? Or 
was Jesus who he really said he was. You see, there are other matters worth also considering, you know, the, the early accounts, all those eyewitnesses, these are all historical realities we have to wrestle with. Simon Chan, in his devotional called The Journey to the Cross, wrote this about the resurrection. He says, the resurrection is an unprecedented event in history, something of which the world had no previous experience of, entered into the old order of things and radically altered it. The great reversal has begun with that resurrection of Christ. Now, please understand, you may say, this isn't worth my time. You want to just dismiss whatever evidence that we want you to wrestle with for this moment. But here's the problem. When you have that kind of mindset where you don't want to engage in this, these historical facts and events that took place, it betrays a mindset when it comes to knowing. As one person says, we can fail to know because we do not want to know. Did you catch that? We can fail to know because we don't want to know. And why don't we want to know? Because what would be known would require us to believe and act in ways contrary to the way we want. I mean, just to say it bluntly, if Jesus really raised from the dead, that everything he said about himself is important and significant, and all the good things of life that, of, all, that often we make the ultimate things of our life, those are still meant to be good, but now we know what the ultimate thing is. But if Jesus didn't raise from the dead... Go back and make whatever good thing of your life your ultimate thing. Be it sports, be it your home, be it your money, be it your family. Make it the ultimate thing because that's all you got anyway. Now, that's tr us trying to talk about this and make sense. Here's the point. If Jesus really walked this earth and made the claims that he made and really conquered death, can I just say it as plainly as I can today? We all here, all of us here have to pay attention we have to talk about it. We have to discuss it. Well, notice in this story, though, that we come to this other part. Not only did they discuss it, but they also discovered something. It says here their eyes were opened. You know, one amazing aspect of this story is they didn't recognize Jesus right away. It seems like Jesus in this new resurrected state could reveal himself to those he chose to reveal himself to and no one else. But we're told as they sat down and had this meal, notice it was in a moment of real intimacy. You want to have a real friendship? Sit down and have a meal with somebody. And in that moment of connection as Jesus broke the bread, what do we read? Their eyes were opened. Their eyes were opened. You know, to put it plainly, I can sit here and we can talk about all the historical facts and the dynamic of that moment 2,000 years ago and how it it's supposed to shape our life today and what it forecasts for the ultimate future. But you know what? At some point, I realized this. God has to open your eyes. You know, it's interesting. I've met people over all the years here I've been pastoring, and I've seen it happen. I've seen people say, you know, I used to come. I used to sit, tune out, and especially I like to have my mobile because I could just play games and not listen to you. Okay. But then all of a sudden, they said, you know, but then I came one Sunday or I, I was actually sitting and listening I actually got enough sleep the night before. I didn't stay up to 2 a.m. in the morning. I actually got rested. And I came and I, I listened and, and something changed, Dave. You know what? I, God started to become real, really real. Uh, you know what? Wasn't my preaching. It isn't that good. Wasn't, wasn't, wasn't the music. Wasn't the lights. It wasn't the building. Wasn't anything. It was God opening your eyes. And you know what? That would be... My, my prayer for you is that God has to do a work in your heart and mind. You know, um, I, I think a simple prayer today would be this. If you're struggling to believe, I dare you to pray this prayer. Just pray a very simple prayer. Say, Jesus, reveal yourself to me and see what happens. Just pray that prayer. Jesus, reveal yourself to me. And, and, and I believe that, that God has a way of revealing himself by the movement of his spirit in your heart and mind, God has a way of revealing himself through reading his word, through people, through circumstances. Just, just, get, just pray that prayer sincerely. You know, so, so that's, if we're going to make sense of it, we have to discuss it, but we know ultimately God has to do something and open our eyes. But here's the other part about the resurrection of Jesus. How do we tell our story about meeting him? 
You know, it's interesting in this story, Luke is recalling how these two people who had met Jesus in their encounter started telling their story. First of all, it says, they go, you know what? Once they realized they'd met Jesus, what did it say? Didn't our hearts burn within us? And, and I, I, I think that when I think about that, our hearts burning within us, that means we come to that moment of decision about believing. I believe that if we're going to encounter the resurrected Jesus today in the 20, year of 2019, we need to be like those followers of the Emmaus Road, where we decide in our hearts to really open ourselves up to him. Please understand that belief ultimately comes from within. You could hang out, maybe your family was Christian. Maybe you grew up coming to church. Maybe you didn't come to church. Here's good news. Whether you came to church or you didn't come to church doesn't make you a Christian. It's your belief in Christ that makes you a Christian. It's kind of like going into a garage and say, I'm a car. You're not a car if you're just going to a garage, see? And as we think about this, this belief that was birthed within those early followers is also has to be birthed within our hearts as well. Our hearts have to burn as well. We have to come to that place of decision at some point in our journey. You know, this isn't on the screen, but can I highlight one simple Bible verse? It's in the Gospel of John, verse, chapter 1, verse 12. And listen to what it says. It says, but to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become the children of God. Did you hear those three key words? Believe, accept it, become. You know, for a lot of us, we might come in today and say, you know what, this is a really nice story, Dave. And you know what? When you really talk about all the historical evidence, and I, as I li think about that, you know what? You got a point. I'll, I'll give you something for that. That's worth, I'll, okay, I believe you. But, but it's not enough just to believe. You have to come to that point where you don't only believe, but you accept. You say, Jesus, if you're real, then I need to let you come into my life in order so I may become what you want me to become. You see, please understand something, that when Jesus comes into our life, we too become part of that new order, that new creation that the resurrection shows us, that, 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 that the old order of things filled with sin and death and decay is giving way to something beyond our comprehension. We need to, we need to turn from our old life and experience life in him. We now need to live in that resurrection reality of Christ. We be, need to become a new creation so we're never the same again. Now, you know how I said about a prayer at the beginning about saying, if you're not sure about it all, just say, Jesus, please reveal this to me. Well, here's a prayer of making a decision on your journey of faith. It's praying simply something like this. Jesus, I believe and I accept you into my heart. I accept you into the very center of my life. You're my savior, my victor, my hope, my rock, my Lord, my king. And then the Bible tells us this. It says, when we open our lives and, and, and accept him, guess what? It says, Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. And your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. You will experience the resurrected reality of Jesus himself. And then what do we see in the end of this story? How do we tell about meeting Jesus? Well, we first of all have to decide, but then we finally have to declare. And what do we declare? Well, look at, look at what the, these two early followers did. It says, it says they went and they told their story of how they met Jesus. That's all they did. They just told their story. And that's what we need to do as well. We need to tell our story of how we met Jesus. You know, we may not have all the answers, you're going to meet people who will scoff and say, that's not for me. But we can share the truth of a new life he brings and how we can walk by faith in him. We find ourselves being drawn into a life with God. Now, declaring the hope and power of Jesus' resurrection through our lives changes everything. Paul says this, I want to know Christ and I want to experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I wonder, do you understand how we are all called to declare Jesus' resurrection in our lives right now? I think we can declare it in a lot of different ways. I see, because I think that when we declare the resurrection of Jesus in our life, what it means is Jesus is raising us up from, from death to life. He's raising us up from despair to hope. He's raising us up from a place of lostness to a place of rather than living for ourselves, we live a, a God-centered life. 
He's raising us from a place of fear and anger and bitterness and worry. He's raising us up rather to a place of hope and love and peace and joy. He, when we live in Jesus' life, guess what? He raises us up from a fear of death to a hope of eternal life. Well, I'm out of time, so I've got to conclude. Um, you know, one thing I have to do a lot, I, I actually got a, a, a question. Someone said, so how long have you been here, Dave? Oh, my goodness. So I found, I, I, I actually got it right down. Uh, 32 years and five months I've been here. Now, um, now here's the thing. And unfortunately, let me tell you a downside of 32 years and five months. I've done a lot of funerals in the community here of Greater Moncton. I've done a lot of funerals. I want to tell you a shift I've seen happen, though, in these funerals. I, I get up, and one of my main messages I preach at every single funeral. So if you came to every one of my funerals, you'd hear me say this. I say, as Christians, when we s- sit here in this moment, in this funeral service, and stare at a coffin... We believe that there's more to life than just this life. We believe that there's more to life than just this life. Now, I want to be honest. When I came here in the 80s, I preached that. Everybody went, yeah, woo! You know what I find today when I say that statement? I find a lot of people who don't come to church, really don't have a faith. They look at me like, seriously, Dave? I can see them going, YOLO. You only live once, Dave. This is it, Dave. I mean, we live in a, we're just biological, you know, organic complex units. And we're all going to, at some point, the old cells break down. I mean, if you don't know that, just take a look in the mirror. (laughs) The body breaks down, the brain breaks down, and we all know, come on, Dave, let's get real. Let's get real. Are you seriously, Dave? And then I, can, I start imagining, as I look at their eyes and they kind of listen to me tell this story uh, that there's more to life than just a life, I know that some of them are thinking this. They're actually thinking, they're going, okay, Dave, what you're telling me is this, that you're saying that, that you can die and that there's a, a life beyond this life and there's something far greater. And rather than the, de- the grave being the end, that it's actually a door into something greater. Now, Dave, if that were true, if that were true, Dave, that would mean somebody would have to die and and, and come back. Oh, ain't it now? That's what happened. He's alive. He came back. Jesus says, I hold the keys over death and Hades. As what's the old hymn say? Because he lives... What? I can face what? Tomorrow. Because he lives, all what is gone? Fear. Because I know he holds tomorrow, I know that life is worth the living. Why? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. God bless you.